Thank you for inviting us today. My name is Mark Neal, and my friend David Len and I are American chestnut enthusiasts. We enjoy giving chestnut presentations around the state and are happy to share our enthusiasm with you this evening. What we're going to tell you today is the story of the tragic loss of one of America's most beloved trees within the space of two generations. It's also the story of hope, as everyone who cares about conservation can play an important role in its return. Today, we have an opportunity to be part of the de-extinction of a species. We do believe that the return of a healthy, blight-resistant chestnut tree is one of the most interesting scientific projects of our time, and one that depends largely on citizen science and volunteers like Dave and me. Now that the American Chestnut Foundation has been in existence for 30 years, we're aware that it has a little history, as you'll see later on in this program. Dave Lent and I have a little history too. We've known each other since seventh grade and share an interest in forestry. Today's Dave works, takes him to construction sites all over Massachusetts where surviving American chestnut trees can be found. We are both members of the American Chestnut Foundation and soon I'll be retiring from my office job. I'm looking forward to doing more volunteer work for the American Chestnut Foundation and presentations like this one too. First, I want to explain that uh, the American chestnut is not the same thing as the horse chestnut or water chestnuts. These are often confused when people see horse chestnut trees. We're talking about something totally different. And it is the goal to restore the American chestnut tree back into its native range. The Mass Rhode Island chapter is carefully doing this by back cross breeding process. We cross black resistant Chinese chestnut trees with American trees. And the utter collapse of this species in the space of just two generations was really devastating. It didn't take long before the cultural memory of chestnut trees was gone, almost as if they never existed. In April 1871, Science of America said, uh, the chestnut is one of the most beautiful of trees and deserves consideration on account of its ornamental character as well as for its material utility. Here we have a fl flowering chestnut uh, tree branch. The uh, long spindly flowers are called catkins, that's the male flower. And in there in the middle, they're a little harder to see, are the female flower, the, the burrs. Here's what the burrs look like in the circle there, and you can see the little spicules that are what pick up the pollen. So the female bird grows over the summer, it gets to be quite large, about the size of a tennis ball, a green tennis ball, and in mid to late October the burrs pop open and eject the chestnuts. They're like pennies from heaven, it can be raining chestnuts. The squirrels get a lot of them too, that's, <laughs> unfortunately that's the thing. You have to get out in the woods, get there at the right time. Usually you have to uh, take the burrows off the tree you know, a week or two early and then let them open on their own. It's always a challenge to get to the nuts before the, the squirrels do. So the chestnut's been gone from our society for so long that if people are asked what comes to mind when they hear the word chestnut, it can be assumed the following song. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire <laughs> comes to mind. It really does. Who doesn't know that song? It's not only a nut. Chestnut is also the name of a color. For example, we have chestnut brown paint and chestnut brown hair. And wood may be a chestnut color. And we have chestnut colored horses. And we have a chestnut enthusiast here, the mayor of uh, Pittsfield, and the color of that podium, that light tan color, is, is actually the color of chestnut wood. What town in America doesn't have a chestnut street, or a chestnut hill, or a chestnut mall? They all do. That's how prevalent the chestnut was, just like you'd have an Elm Street or a Pine Street. 
And we know that the forests today are vastly different than in pre-Columbian forests the settlers found when they first came here. Fragmentation or unwise clear-cutting invasive plants and insects have left the forest weakened and under stress, lacking biodiversity. Today's wildlife has a lot of challenges and less resources than they used to. And the ecosystems that they used to know are gone. So wildlife is also beginning to live closer to humans. Chestnuts have been around for a very long time. There are four main varieties or species, actually different species of chestnut. Chinese, Japanese, European, and American. All of the American are blight resistant. The leaves are different too. The tree growth habits are different. The sweetness and flavor of the nuts are different. The size of the nut is also different. Here we have the larger nut on the bottom right. That's a European chestnut, which has been under cultivation for many, many centuries and bred to create a big, big nut. The nut on the far left, that's the American. It's the smallest and also the most tasty. So one out of four hardwood trees was a chestnut. In some areas, most of the forest was chestnut. In fact, there may have been chestnut hotspots of more than 100 acres of pure chestnut stand. The area in which I live, Swan Pond Road, was formerly a chestnut hotspot. It extends from South Linfield through North Reading and on over to Andover. A hundred years ago, this was mostly a chestnut forest. Chestnuts are also known as a keystone species because a lot of other species depended on it like a keystone supports an arch. Its loss can be accurately described as one of the worst environmental disasters in North America during the 20th century. Legend has it that a squirrel could have traveled from Maine to Georgia without ever having to leave the, the branches of a chestnut tree. In the past, uh, the trues, trees grew to be huge. It was said that by the time a white oak acorn had grown to the size of a baseball bat, a chestnut would have made a railroad tie. It was a perfect forest tree because it served so many needs of both people and wildlife. And there it is. Uh, it out in Ware, Massachusetts, uh, an open orchard tree. It's too bad there's not a, a person in that. Uh, you could see by size comparison, but an open orchard tree spreads out quite a bit, and, and it grows a little differently than a um, than a forest tree. A forest tree is. Uh, take a second look at that. That's a forest tree, and an open field tree would grow with more spreading branches like that. So, ooh, skip to forward. The largest tree on record was 17 feet in diameter. You can see, they're enormous. You can see that the trees were properly named the redwood trees of the east. Henry David Thoreau studied chestnut trees and wrote that they grow so fast that a mature chestnut tree would be produced in 70 to 80 years. See the little man? The little forester is in there. So for the first 300 years after the settlers arrived, the chestnut was used much as we would use plywood or pressure treated lumber today. It was in constant use up until recent times. Even after the trees were wiped out, the remaining lumber was still used. In the fall, harvested chestnuts were loaded onto wagons and taken to railroad depots and transported to cities to be roasted and sold by pushcart vendors on street corners. Chestnuts were actually America's first fast food. Probably the last fast food that was actually good for you, too. It was common practice to fatten hogs on acorns and chestnuts, with most towns allowing animals to run free so that they could forage for chestnuts in the woods. 
We've all heard that Abe Lincoln was a rail splitter, but what you may not know uh, is that uh, the rails he was splitting were actually chestnut. Chestnut's natural resistance to rot made it perfect for fence posts and rails. It was easy to split and resisted rotting, even after being in the ground for long periods of time. By the late 19th century, because of economic growth and railroad expansion, somewhere between 9 and 12 million railroad ties were needed every year. Because of its rot resistance, the wood was excellent, not only for fence rails, but for railroad ties and utility poles. There, um, there was a storm in Paxton, Massachusetts in 2008, and all of the telephone poles in towns were broken down, except for the chestnut poles that were still standing, uh, where it had been installed in the 1920s. There's still a utility pole down on the Cape, and it, it was uh, installed in 1928, and is still standing today. So very, very long-lasting, durable wood. So the chestnut was used extensively for furniture. It is lightweight, it's easy to work with, it didn't warp, and it had a beautiful grain and color. Many times chestnut was used as the core of stock in fine furniture, which was then veneered over with pricier woods. There's a market for salvaged chestnut wood, too, and one of the places they find it is in old pianos. You know that old piano that's been kicking around a long time? That's the place where they salvage uh, chestnut wood and could make things like that guitar. So they were known as a cradle-to-grave tree in places where chestnut was abundant because it was central to people's existence throughout their lives. It was often remarked that an infant would be placed in a chestnut cradle at birth and then into a chestnut coffin at the end of life. Cradle to grave tree. The mature chestnut tree can produce 10 bushels of nuts in a year. That's over 6,000 nuts. Notice the chestnut in the mouth of the partridge in the lower right corner. Chestnuts amounted to about two-thirds of all the food for animals. This food is also called mast. Bear, deer, turkeys, and many other species of woodland animals depended on a plentiful supply of the chestnuts every fall. The hogs that were allowed to free range under the chestnut trees also had superior flavor. <laughs> The green lines on the left of this graph represent the percentage of wildlife mass that was chestnut. As you can see, it was really a very prolific tree of all nuts. The graph on the right shows wildlife mass after the blight came through. As you can see, the food values were much lower and in some cases very, very low. Unlike most nut trees, the chestnut flower is very late each year and the flowers are never subject to frost like oaks or hickories. Thus, the plentiful supply of chestnuts is guaranteed nearly every year. The Christmas song was composed by Mel Torm in 1946. And it recalled the nostalgia of Christmas past, but the time the song was recorded by Nat King Cole, chestnuts were actually functionally extinct. We hope that next holiday season, when people hear the song, that they'll have a totally new vision of roasting chestnuts. Because the chestnuts we buy in the store today are either Chinese, European, or hybrid mix. They are not like the originals. Ah, chestnutting was an activity that had been going on for centuries. Both images here show either throwing things up into a tree or climbing the tree to shake the nuts down. Chestnutting was a highly social occasion, and still is, actually, in many parts of the world today. History indicates that chestnuts were indeed part of the first Thanksgiving. The Native Americans have been using all parts of the tree. The, the bark was used for roofing and siding on their wigwams. The leaves were used for teas and for medicine. And the nuts were eaten whole or ground into cornmeal dough, either boiled or baked. Roasting chestnuts was very common family experience, as was seeing pushcart vendors selling roasted chestnuts along city streets. This was America's first fast food. 
Here's a cookbook of chestnut recipes. Here it's noted that there is no nut in our woods to compare with it as food. Chefs all over the world agreed that the American chestnut was the sweetest and the nuttiest flavor of chestnut of them all. Here's how they might appear for gathering off the ground. Nuts fall usually before the birds. Chestnuts can be eaten raw, freshly harvested from beneath the tree, or cured for several days to allow some of the starches to turn to sugars. They can be cooked, roasted, boiled, pureed, added to soups, sauces, dressings, used as appetizers, first courses, main courses, side dishes, and desserts. They're a perishable crop. It should be treated more like a grain or stored like onions. This bar graph shows chestnuts are low in calories compared to other nuts. For example, about a quarter of the calories of macadamia nuts and a third of the calories of peanuts. And they're high in nutritional value too, with complex carbohydrates, protein, high in vitamin C and potassium. Chestnuts are nutritious and good for you. Not at all like America's other fast food. <laughs> With an indefinite shelf life, loads of preservatives, sugar, fat, other ingredients that sound more like chemical names. Not much comparison here. Really. <coughs> so the chestnut bark disease arrived at the turn of the 20th century. It was discovered in 1904 by Herman Merkel. He was the chief forester at the New York Zoological Park, now the Bronx Zoo, and the first to call attention to this disease that was killing all of the chestnuts in his park. The rapid spread of the disease and resulting collapse of the tree had a domino effect on the ecology and the economy, especially where it was a prime crop and commodity. Communities in the heart of the range were devastated as mountain families were left without the game they depended on to eat. Without the food to feed their domestic animals and without holiday cash they depended on in exchange for shoes and other basic needs. This was often called shoe money. The chestnut blight can be seen here as the yellow-orange growth on the bark of the trees. It generally enters any disturbance or injury in the bark of a tree, like a branch breaking off or the bark disturbance caused by an animal. Eventually, the bark lifts away from the tree, shutting off the nutrient system of the tree and effectively curling it. The fungus is airborne and carried by bugs, birds, mammals, and anything else that comes into contact with the bark of the trees. The chestnut tree on the left has a beautiful gray, rich bark and is blight free, whereas the tree on the right exhibits the disease. And the orange, the orange color is the hallmark of the chestnut blight. Okay, this was the worst ecological disaster of the 20th century, chestnut blight otherwise known as chestnut bark disease, went through Central Mass and Western Mass during the second decade of the 20th century. The green indicates the range of the chestnut tree, and the red lines with dates show the timeline of the disease that made the tree functionally extinct. It passed through Massachusetts by 1914 in all of New England. It really was very well. By 1950, it had destroyed over 4 billion trees. And here's a blight ravaged agricultural landscape that show, shows the devastation. So, in some cases, bulldozers were used to take down the trees. Even the wood from these dead trees, though, was used for many things. Tanning industry flourished with new factories which were built to process the wood. Both the bark and the wood of these trees contain high amounts of tannin, which is used in leather manufacture. Much of the wood was also used for boards and beams. 
with old, long-standing dead trees being used. Some people may have heard of the word wormy chestnut. These were standing trees that were affected by insects, but the, the wood was still good. So many places, especially in the Appalachian Mountains, were left with ghost forests. Because the disease does not affect the roots of the chestnut tree, many of these trees remain standing for a very long time, forever sending up new shoots. Even today in forests, within the range, sprouting stumps can still be seen today. That's what we have in North Reading, in all over Massachusetts, in fact. The blight is not active in the ground, so these trees are actually doomed to repeat this process of sprouting, dying, re-sprouting, and dying again. So despair was spreading just as the blight, uh, as people realized the potential damage that this bark disease would do to their beloved chestnut trees. And few people had any hope at all. And Robert Frost wrote an interesting uh, poem called uh, Evil, Ten Evil Tendencies Cancel in 1936 by Robert Frost. So I, want to, I want to recite it for you. Robert Frost wrote, Will the blight end the chestnut? The farmers rather guess not. They keep smoldering at the roots and sending up new shoots till another parasite shall come when the blight. And that was, uh, poem was kind of pro prosthetic, prophetic. Because there is another parasite that came along uh, to weaken the blight fungus, and uh, we call that hypervirulence, and um, it has enabled some of the trees to survive today. And we have some examples of that, which I'll show, be showing you later. Um, here is a, a call for a conference in Pennsylvania uh, from 1912. They wanted to cut a swath through the forest to prevent the blight from going west. And they cut down over 30,000 trees to try to stop the disease. But the blight continued to spread with sickening rapidity. Um, not, they didn't understand um, airborne pathogens in those days. And not long after, uh, afterwards, the government suspended all research and attempts to bring the tree back. It seemed like there was no way. Perhaps no one expressed better the sadness that Americans felt at that time about the loss of the chestnut than this fellow here. He was a preeminent naturalist of his day, one of the most influential nature writers of the 20th century. And he said, all words about the chestnut are now but an allergy for it. An allergy is a sad, sorrowful song or poem. This once mighty tree, one of the grandest features of our silver forest, has gone down like a slaughtered army before a foreign fungus disease, the chestnut blade. Real low well point. Until, ooh, until Charles Burnham came along. He had a lifelong curiosity about what had happened to the chestnut, and uh, was when he. Uh, was done being busy with his professional career teaching and in research and retired as a university professor. He had time to devote to the chestnut research. Essentially, prior to him, his research, they had been crossing, back crossing American chestnuts with Asian trees. And in doing the back crossing, uh, they were losing the American characteristics of a tall, straight, character tree um, while trying to incorporate the resistance of the Asian trees, which grew more like fruit trees. Um, but uh, after talking with other scientists, uh, they decided to um, be, that uh, a, a different kind of back cross method could be employed, and the American Chestnut Foundation was started. That was in 1983. This is the basic principle of the Charles Burnham back cross breeding program method, and it's really easily understood by looking at this chart. 
basically, you cross an American with a Chinese chestnut tree, creating a 50-50 tree. Then you back cross the American tree to uh, you back cross that 50-50 tree with a with an American tree to increase the American characteristics. Well checking for blight resistance and American growth characteristics at each generation. The trees that don't exhibit good blight resistance are roped out, leaving only those that show good blight resistance and American characteristics to go on to the next generation. So presently, the Massachusetts and Rhode Island chapter um, is at this first intercross, uh, this 94% American tree, um, and, and is, uh, is, uh, is raising these trees in what are called seed orchards. Um, they're very big orchards of 3,000 or more trees, out of which will be thinned down, selected down to only 15 or 20 trees um, in 15 to 20 years from now. So it's a, it's a long, it's a long. It's a long-term process, and it's uh, very labor-intensive, too. Any questions on this? You get the idea? It's uh, you. good. The, the intercross, though, is very important, because every time that you, you breed with an American tree, you, the American parent has no resistance. And so you have to take these, these third back cross trees, these 94% hybrid American trees and breed them together so that you get resistance from both the mother and the father tree. That's the tree that can be put out in the forest and will breed with itself and can propagate and reforest an area. So it's a very interesting design. They grow the same size as they did in the past? Yes, they're essentially indistinguishable um, in size and, and nature from, from the real American. Ninety-four percent American tree is, is uh, essentially American, but it is a hybrid. It has that one characteristic that we want, the, the resistance from the Chinese tree. So Meadowview Research Farms is the, nation, the national organization science headquarters out in the field, and they're in Meadowview, um, Virginia, and that is building there. And Fred Hebbard was the, he has a master's degree in botany and a doctorate in plant pathology, was the chief scientist for many years at the, at the Meadowview uh, farm in Virginia. He recently retired and uh, has been replaced by a, a new uh, director of science uh, named Jared Westbrook. And uh, he's a geneticist with a genetic background. Okay, this shows the state chapters we have now, with the green being the states in the natural range, and the orange states where we have members or chapters. So it is a big national organization. And here is <coughs> Massachusetts. We have about 350 members. It shows where our current research orchards are located and some of the mother trees that are pollinated to uh, use to increase the genetic diversity. As you can see, there is plenty, pretty much uh, chestnuts throughout the entire state, especially in the center of the state. Okay, the, the Massachusetts Rhode Island Chapter Board uh, is a varied group of people that include a Latin teacher, a physician, botany professor, a mailman, electrical engineer, an apple orchardist, as well as a psychologist, college librarian, and a retired utility company forester. So these are not people that are tree specialists, but they're all very much into chestnut trees. Okay. You might wonder how they select out the trees. They select out the trees that have the resistance by actually inoculating the trees. Dave has actually done this, haven't you, Dave? Yes, we, we did um, some as a small orchard up in Littleton. And we 
worked on a year or so ago. Yeah, well, they, they cut a little plug out of the tree and then they infect it with, uh, with a plug of the blight fungus. And then, and then six months to a year later, they evaluate the trees and give them a rating from one to five. And here's what that looks like. And where one is the most resistant on the scale of one to five, and five being the highest number and the worst kind of canker and the least resistance that a tree could have. So anything but a one gets removed from the orchard. That's how they select for the resistance. Okay, Moore State Park had an orchard um, of 233 trees, which had been reduced down to 15. And then after more evaluation, will be robbed down to four or five trees. So it's very, very highly selected. Uh, and those will produce the seeds that are used in the seed orchards, that intercross where they, they breed, um, that go for homologous pairs of chromosomes with, with resistance coming from both parent trees. The trees are uh, bisexual, but they don't self-pollinate. They have to get pollen from another tree in order to produce fertile nuts. Okay, so here are the seed orchards. Now here's one out uh, at uh, the McLeish Field Station in Wakeley, Massachusetts. You can see these are large in size, many thousands of trees. Uh, here's a lot of preparation that goes into, uh, into setting up one of these seed orchards. Here's one in Grainville, Mass, that Dave and I have both worked on. They started uh, a whole year before planting by putting up deer fencing. It's on private property, and uh, the fields have begun to be uh, turning into forests. So we had to take down a lot of trees and burn them on the premises to make room for, for the chestnuts. Okay, here's another at Springfield Park in Pittsfield. They put down plastic mulch, which kills the grass, and the collars, those plastic collars, actually is small animal protection rodents. Everything loves to eat chestnuts, so that uh, mice and rodents, chipmunks, squirrels, and voles, they will eat them otherwise. So that is actually protection of the nut. And um, while it's in the ground, they can smell it right through the soil. Delicious, and they'll eat it. So <laughs> they need protection. Okay, the Mass Fish and Wildlife Headquarters in Westboro has an enormous as an enormous uh, seed orchard. Wait till you see this in the next slide. Look at that. We'll be planting 3,000 trees out there, and that'll be in the next 10 or 15 years. I mean, next 15 or 20 years will be cut down to just 15 or 20 trees. And those will be high volume production trees, producing uh, blight resistant, potentially blight resistant chestnuts. So here are some of the partners. We don't do this work all alone. Our partners uh, help us. Uh, and these are a list of uh, individuals and entities that share the same mission with us. Communities, town cemeteries, land trusts. And we also do things like demonstration plantings of two to five trees, usually in a public place where Chestnuts uh, were once found, like Old Sturbridge Village. And there's a nice view of, a nice mountain view during, around the 4th of July, when chestnuts were abundant, these uh, mountains would be, they would appear to be uh, snow covered because there'd be so much white pollen covering the trees. They would actually look like they were snow-capped mountains. And here's a nice uh, quote by President Jimmy Carter, uh, who's one of the honorary uh, presidents of the foundation, and what he said, which is very, very nice. We are committed to doing what we can to preserve the land and restore where we can those parts that have been damaged by human use. 
I consider the breeding and restoration of light-resistant chestnut trees in the United States to be one of the most interesting and important scientific projects of our time. Even more, it satisfies a spiritual longing to acknowledge our obligation to be better stewards of God's creation. Isn't that nice? Well, that concludes our, our PowerPoint presentation. And um, if you'd like, we can take a little break or I can answer questions. But I'd like to move on to, um, to show you what some of our local trees look like, which you can find right out here in our own hometown and nearby communities. Yes, we have questions. Yes. Yeah. Talk about how with this, uh, I don't know what you call it, not, not the, you know, bring the two brands together. Right. You start with hundreds and you end up with one. Yes, they're highly selective because... So, uh, what happens, you can't regrow the whole chestnut around the United States because you only get five trees at a time or something, right? It's going to take, it's really going to take, it's the scope of this project is going to be at least a century or more. It's going to well, take hundreds yeah. of years to, re, to get the forest yeah, anything well, back to what they used to be. We are passing, just passing the torch here. We're just getting this off the ground. And um, there's actually... Our Massachusetts chapter is primarily concerned with this back breeding process with hybrid trees. There are other pathways to resistance too. Uh, there are people working with hypervirulence and there are the New York chapter is working with transgenetic trees. And uh, those are very promising prospects and a greatly accelerated program which I want to talk more about, especially to anybody who wants to grow chestnuts and be part of our effort. Um, this is something, this is real citizen science. This is something you can do in your own backyard. And I can provide you with seedlings and nuts, and I'm happy to do so um, if you want. And I'll explain more about that later. Yes, sir, you've got a question. Yes, yeah, so. you'll have to pardon me for yeah. coming in late. Oh, that's but fine. I missed something. This foreign fungus that you mentioned. Yeah. That wiped out American chestnuts. Yeah. Where did it come from? It How came from did it China. get here? Came from Asia. What happened? When? Uh, around that, it was first uh, noticed in, in, in uh, 1904 in the Bronx Zoo, and uh, it spread throughout the range very rapidly within a 50-year period. It had all of the uh, Native American chestnut trees that truly belonged here were either dead or dying by 1950. It just spread like wildfire. Through, uh, it was an airborne pathogen, uh, airborne spores you know, released by the billion, kind of like the common cold virus. It's just out there, it's everywhere. And the trees had no natural defense against it because they evolved separately from the other chestnut trees which are resistant to it, okay. which brought it, brought it to us. So the Chinese trees are resistant to this fungus? Yes, they are, and they are the culprit. Somebody. Okay. Back in those days, it was kind of in vogue to have arboretums, and people brought in exotic plants from all <coughs> over the world, and uh, one of the places, probably high society people in New York, and they wanted, uh, they wanted Chinese chestnuts located nearby, and it's, the, the fungus is normally found in the Chinese chestnut tree, and the tree can live with it, but uh, there was no natural defense in the American chestnut to this blight fungus and so it was just cut down and wiped out without, without any mercy. Oh, it's the same as the uh, Eurasian milk oil that infects the water, the life in the water. And that came from Europe also, Europe and Asia. And it gets here and then you have to learn to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, we have to live with it. It's, it's not easy. Yes, ma'am? How quickly do chestnuts grow? They grow very rapidly, very, very rapidly. In fact, that's where you find them in cleared out areas, like construction sites that go into the forest and open the forest to light. Um, they're light-seeking and they're very opportunistic. They'll be the first plants to spring up from these root shoots, uh, from these existing uh, uh, root systems underground. Uh, they'll overtake other trees until the blight gets them. And usually, 
Sometimes they'll grow right up to the canopy, and they'll grow very slowly for a number of years, but when they break through the canopy, in the upper air currents, um, a bird will come by, land on the tree, and, and, and be carrying the, the um, spores on its feet, and you know, it'll, it'll engulf the tree, and it will kill it. So they usually don't make it um, to the canopy of the forest. And they grow as understory trees. They grow in the shade, and unfortunately, they don't get enough sunlight to flower. So they, so they are out in the forest. Why don't we take a little break? And, uh, I have just one question. Yes. I noticed you have support from uh, places like Old Sturbridge. Yes. So other historical institutions further south and west. Yes. How, how are they supporting the effort? You know, like um, Jefferson's homestead and Charlotte's. Yes. Because yes. they, they have a major garden that right. supplies their historic site. Right, right. They provide good public relations and visibility for the foundation. They give us places for <coughs> demonstration plantings and put signage. And uh, they, they may be also uh, partners in some financial uh, things too. They may supply uh, grounds for some of our uh, breeding orchards. And they're just interested in partnering with us and hoping to restore the tree. I, I mean, I wondered if they did any. The nitty gritty groundwork is they done by volunteers. Done by done by volunteers, so people like Dave and me. Okay, I mean they have garden farm stuff. Yeah, yeah. Probably can see. I just wondered if they use that. Yep, some of some of our orchards are in land trusts. Uh, and, and, and trees are being raised in conjunction with other groups that do the planning and do the raising and some of the volunteer work you know, during the summer and during the growing season. It is a lot of, of getting your hands dirty, yes. down on your hands and needs work. And, uh, different uh, garden societies partner with us and, and do that kind of thing. So. Yes, sir. Uh, so when, what does the government uh, do at all, anything at all in this endeavor? Yes, the government sponsors, the, the U.S. Forest Service is very interested and uh, they provide some of the funding that uh, I'm, I'm not involved in the, the, the upper echelons of the organization, but there's a lot of government funding. There is a, oh yes. So the government is, would it's like to see the chestnut come back? Or oh yes, you know, it would be a wonderful screen. And it, it, we want to get it back. Definitely an important tree. There's no, there's no organization out there that would not want to see it come back. I don't think it is. I don't think it's. Uh, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't. Well, want I mean, I guess it sounds like you're saying is that once this gets going in a forest a hundred years from now, yeah. it'll take it'll it over. take a long time. But it will but pretty much take it over like it was in the past. Well, that's the idea. I don't think it'll ever be really exactly the same as it was the native, uh, <coughs> native forest. But, uh, you know, it will play an important role in providing uh, food for animals and man, and uh, lumber, useful wood material. If we had chestnut trees today, we would, and we wouldn't have all this pressure treated stuff that we've got today. We can build a back torch and just build another chestnut. The way they did in the old days, get this pressure treated stuff. Or you'd be, we'd be using them for telephone poles. They last forever. So it's a it's a wonderful tree. Yeah. So I've got some. Uh, should we take a little break? Don't you want a break? Well, I need to change some settings here on this machine. So I think that uh, perhaps we take a little break here. And, uh, to the, I'd like you to, to the take a look at the uh, display items we have up here. I have and some brochures, and Dave can answer your questions. And uh, yeah, so throughout Massachusetts, that Dave and I have found and photographed. We've got a nice selection of just my trees. The first slide I'm going to show you here is kind of important. It's just a uh, 
botanical print. But it, take a look at that root system. That's a tap root, and, and chestnut trees have tap roots that go down deep into the soil. This is perhaps a bit exaggerated because it looks like there's as much underneath the ground as there is above the ground. Typically, these roots go down about eight feet. So this is how the, the chestnut has been able to survive. It survives at the roots. It does not reproduce by, by producing nuts. It survives at the roots, and the roots send up shoots. The shoots get the blight that die back down, and they're caught up in this endless cycle. So, anybody wants to meet me, this is the end of Meyer Street, Swamp Pond Road, and you see this tree, not the big one, the little one in front of it. That is a chestnut. That is a chestnut root shoot trying to grow. And it's, uh, you can see where it's turned brown. It looks like it's dead. Well, because it is dead. <laughs> but you can see surrounding, you can see surrounding root shoots. And this is how chestnut trees grow. They grow more like bushes than they do like trees. But underneath that little bush, okay, is a big root system underground. And it's actually over 100 years old. There was once a big tree in that very place. And underneath there's this living root system still underground. So that is a root shoot bush. A little further down the road, this is on Swan Pond Road too, we have this lovely tree. Here is a chestnut tree growing in the shade. This is an understory tree. It hasn't made it to the canopy yet. It's growing at a very, very, very slow rate of speed. And so the, the bark has managed to stay intact intact enough so that a spore of the fungus has not been able to get in there. I have an idea about this tree because it's very unusual. It has about 30 other chestnuts around it and they're all <coughs> diseased and dying and caught up in that endless cycle. But this tree just won't get the blight. And I think I know the reason why. There's a, somebody piled up a, a bunch of logs next to this tree and it's a decomposing wood pile. And I think that there is a a competing fungus that has uh, infiltrated the bark of this tree and has displaced the parasitic fungus that would normally kill the tree. That's my theory. That's my idea. I think it would make an interesting project for a graduate student to come out and take a look at it because we've got this lovely tree that just refuses to get light stricken and is growing very, very slowly in the forest. That tree is probably 60 or 80 years old, even though it looks you know, perhaps like a, a little sapling. It's a lovely tree, and lovely form, single stem. It's growing like a tree, not a bush, but a tree. So there's the leaves. The leaves are very, very, very thin, and they come to pointed edge, and they have this uh, kind of a sawtooth edge, a dentata. The, it's named for its teeth. It looks like the crest of a wave or a star fish hook. Very characteristic uh, leaf pattern. And here's where you typically will find them, along the edges of construction sites, or where the meadow meets the forest. They're light-seeking, and they'll spring up wherever there is light. Isn't that lovely? You can see the characteristic shape and those teeth, those curved teeth of the, of the leaves. Here's a two trucker that um, that Dave and I found up in Swan Pond. It's up by the uh, water tower on Swan Pond Road. Um, I like this uh, picture because it shows the mound where there was a stump, and you can see the two the two trunks growing up out of what used to be a stump, and that was a big tree at one time. You can plainly see it. I raked away the leaves here to, to show that. And as it reaches the canopy, it will get infested with the, with the blight. In fact, it's a skinnier trunk that you see here. Is blight infected? And uh, this year we watched it grow, and the leaves only grew to half the size of the, the other one. And we actually cut it out so to get rid of that blight infected half of the tree. And the other part is doing fine. I hope it makes it to the uh, canopy. It would be nice to have a flowering chestnut. They're very, very rare. You don't find flowering chestnuts hardly anywhere. But, um, and this is another thing, typically what you see 
here you have a dead ghost in the middle with root shoots coming up all around it. This is a very, very common sight of what you will see in the forest. And here, here we have the blight fungus all over the, the base of the, of the tree. This is where I usually um, hits first because the, it's the thickest part of the trunk and it's a place where it cracks first. And so little animals, as they scamper around a squirrel or a chipmunk, you know, will, will transfer the, the, the spores over. And you can see it, it's all over this tree. And it's, the tree is trying to survive by sending out new shoots. Okay. There is a flowering chestnut tree in Swan Pond. That's down on Dogwood Avenue. Um, it's on its last leg, and this is its last gasp. <laughs> But it's out there in the sunshine. It's actually flowers on that tree. You can see the little things that look like sprinklers. Those are the male catkins. And that tree flowered. And there it is. You can see both the burrs and the catkins, the male and female flowers. They're both apparent on that tree. Um, I collected the pollen from this tree and um, and I'm saving it in the freezer to kind of capture the genetic diversity. I want to save that pollen and use it to cross with other trees in the future. So that's uh, it's kind of like having money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is the famous uh, Berry Pond tree. Anybody can go up to Berry Pond. It's right in the parking lot. It's very close. Look at the size of that tree. This is a big tree. Trees like this, I have it on good authority from Fred Hebert himself, who was the chief scientist at Meadowview Research Labs. These, these trees, um, is known as a, a large survivor. He's lived with the virus and lived with the fungus uh, for more than 30 years. And um, the trees like this probably do have some low level of natural blight resistance. And they're found like one in a hundred million and we've got one just a, so just a few miles down the street. Everybody should know about this tree. It's been part of our breeding program for many, many years. It's got a little sign on it that says American Chestnut that they put on it when they first pollinated it to use it in our back breeding program. And um, recently it's been cut. The dead parts have been cut off of it. So it's kind of funny looking now it's with its top missing. But that tree, you can't kill it. It's, uh, it's, it's a fruit? amazing tree. It's a berry pond. It's is a fruit? No, yes. it's not a fruit tree. It's a chestnut tree. But, I mean, does it, 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 it fruit? Yes, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Yeah, okay. it's, it's flowering. Yeah, this thing okay. is flowering. So does, how, there, how, there are some of the flowers. Okay, the how baby. close does the, you say it's not self-pollinated, how close does another one have to be? Within a half a mile. Okay, it's open air pollination, and uh, they need, you need to sit, you needed two trees, and within a half a mile is is uh, is is, uh, is usually good. And uh, there's the tree, and there's the burr. You see the little burr, and guess who pollinated that little burr? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. I hand pollinated that thing to make sure that it would produce a burr, and there I am. Oh, right. Yeah, well, there I am. Last October, I got I got a nut off of that tree. That was perhaps the only one this isolated tree produced. But I'm very happy. You can see the smile on my face. Yeah, it does produce burrs that look like that, but there's nothing in them. There'll be three flat nuts and have no. Uh, no yeah. meat. I had a, I had a Chinese chestnut and it would grow five little, you know, it would grow a whole chestnut. It like five, it was like split it in five pieces or four different pieces. So I never got any chestnuts out of it. Any, anything of any size. Now here is the top of the tree that was cut off. And take a look at that scar tissue that were walled off the blight fungus. Oh, look at that heavy, heavy scar tissue. This is probably the reason why this tree has survived. Right there. Yeah. You can see the scar tissue laid down. That's the first line of protection against the fungus, and this has got a lot of it. Hmm. Now here is another um, nearby tree. This is the Lorraine Park Campground tree on the way to Field Pond in Harold Parker. It's a magnificent tree. It's about 65 or 70 feet tall. 
It's an isolated tree growing right alongside of the trail, and it's a flowering tree. And it'll give you an idea of how of its size with a person standing next to it. And there's a nice look right up the trunk of the tree. This is a kind of a characteristic branching pattern. When you get to know chestnuts, you'll recognize one, even if it's like in the winter, or something, you'll see this pattern. It has a lovely, I love when the sunlight shines through the leaves. The leaves are so thin and green that they, they kind of light up almost like Christmas lights. Like stained glass. They're wonderful, yes. They're, they're just, it's just lovely, very, very thin, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful leaf. It's lovely. And here it is flowering. Oh, wow. Look at that. that. Looks like sprinklers. You can see why you mountains would look snow covered when they had trees like this. And every fourth tree was exploding around Fourth of July. It actually even looks like fireworks. Yeah. More. Looks like pipe cleaners. So, aside from the disease, how long would these trees be expected to live? It depends how lucky they are. This tree uh, is soon to be unlucky. I'm going to show you what's going to happen to this tree pretty soon. So we, we got in touch with one of our partners in National Grid, and we got a, they gave us the use of a bucket truck, and we went up to pollinate those. You can see some of the bags that are up there. We, we covered the the flowers after they're pollinated with bags. There we strip off the uh, leaves and the male catkins to reveal the female burrs. They get pollinated and then bagged to prevent any stray pollen from pollinating. So this is part of the scientific control and make sure we control the pollination. We're breeding uh, blight resistant pollen with the, with the American bees. Part of the back crop. This is part of the mother tree that the Lorraine Park campground is the pure American that we're taking a hybrid back cross pollen and breeding it to. Okay. All right. And here we are after the harvest. You can see we got a couple big garbage bags full of chestnuts. And there is Janet Ramsey. She's the lady in charge of getting us that bucket truck, and she's just so thrilled to see she's holding one of the burrs that we open, and there it is. Fibre chestnuts, fertile chestnuts. Now here's the way the tree looks today. It's been infected with the blight, and that's a telltale sign, that uh, orangey, reddish color in the bark. And this will be the future of that tree. It's going to die. It, it, it's going to, and it'll be just like this one. This one is uh, a ghost tree that is found that we found out um, by Equestrian and Dogwood Lanes, where the two cross. There's a little trail that goes into the woods. The tree is right there. It recently fell over, and there it is. That's how it sits. <clears throat> And uh, what's remarkable about this tree, look how well preserved it is. That tree's been dead for maybe 30, 40 years. And it's lost its bark, but the, all the rest of it is still there. These things are indestructible. They really do last. The tree's been out in the woods and just doesn't decompose. That is interesting. Um, here this shows the chestnut tree density. Okay, the remaining root shoot system stems, they call them here. And you can see Massachusetts, especially central Massachusetts, has some of the highest concentration of chestnut trees in the range. You know, we were like chestnut tree central right here in central Mass. Very, very high concentration. And this is where Dave comes in and finds them all over the place. Take a look, there's a little closer up. Central Massachusetts. Right in the heart of the range. Okay, now here's here's an interesting place. Maybe maybe Dave, you can tell us about this because you discovered it. Give us a story. Looks like uh, 
Tell, tell us what's going on here. Yeah, it looks like uh, the area of Freetown Fall River, just off the Route 24, the uh, woods origi originally was an oak woods <laughs> with chestnuts growing uh, underneath, and the, the gypsy moths killed off the oak trees maybe 20, 30 years ago because they've all rotted, and that's pretty much that's what the oak trees look like now. <laughs> They have, uh, that was from China too, right? The gypsy yes. moth. I, yeah, I think it was an Asian import. They wanted to make silk with it or something. That's, that's the story I heard. Yeah. yeah. Actually, this year, is that this was a bad gypsy moth year. A lot of the trees, the chestnuts, had their leaves eaten. So there weren't too many uh, chestnuts to harvest in the area. Let's, let's go forward. So here, here is where chestnuts have sprung up to replace the missing oak trees. Right, Dave? And that's you. Yeah. And here's what they, we typically, we will find the location of a tree and mark its location and also collect a leaf sample and send it in for identification. They put that leaf under a microscope and they look at its microscopic anatomy to make sure that this is a purebred chestnut tree. And uh, here we are. We give these trees names. Do you remember this one, Dave? Hey, this is what we, we call the, the laying down tree. <laughs> the lying down tree. Because it fell out. It fell over. And it's lying down. But it fell out into the sunshine. And look at that. It produced flowers and birds. So and the, and the burrs are only this high off the ground, so you don't have to have a fork or a bucket truck to, to reach them. Yeah, we like that. We like that a lot. And we've done some practice pollination here. We brought in pollen from other parts of the state and crossed them. So that we have, we're capturing the genetic diversity of the chestnuts by doing this. This is uh, Freetown Fall River uh, burrs crossed with uh, Westboro pollen. Um, kind of Westboro. And look, look at there how this year. And look at how heavy and abundant okay, this crop really is. These are trees that are successfully reproducing in the wild. This is very rare. This is not to be found very often. Okay, and they found trees. Here again we've got several generations of tree coming from. This is a winter photo. Winter is a nice time to, to photograph trees because the leaves don't get in the way. And you can see the real anatomy of the tree here. It's got the central ghost. It's got root shoots coming up all around. Some of them have died. And uh, <clears throat> others, other smaller ones are coming in to take its place. All right. So, all right. Dave, you want to tell us where this is? <coughs> this looks like the, uh, you see the number 11 on there. This is down in uh, Sharon. It's on uh, Mass, uh, what's called Moose Hill. It's a uh, Mass Audubon property, just, just off 95. And it's, the uh, trees seem to have the hypervirulence. The, uh, they have the real ugly bark, but they seem to manage to survive. And quite well. Look at the size of that tree. This is a full-size chestnut tree. Very rare and unusual. And here's one. This is our, we call this the premier tree. Dave discovered it. It's interesting to see the, the thin ghost in the middle, you know, the, like the original tree that had died and then how well the ones surrounding it are doing. There is that one branch in the back, you can see it turn, that turned brown this summer. And that's the branch that we put our tag on the number of the tree. So you can see the bark is cruddy. It's, it's got this cruddy bark and it's got the, the fungus which is infected by a virus which weakens the fungus so the tree is somehow or another able to survive. This is one of the pathways for resistance that some of the other chapters are really investigating trying to figure out. It's a, it's a way that we can get trees to grow full size. 
Well, we got, how many do we figure trees like this we have? There are about 30 of these, 30 big trees. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's probably 30 trees that are capable of producing nuts. So, and that's it's a very hilly, rocky area. It's sort of like the area was farmed at one time, and that area was too hilly to farm, and somehow chestnuts ended up on it. And there we have it. Look at that in all its glory. That's what the premier tree looks like. Looks like when it's full of nuts. And their, uh, their, their burrs seem to open a week earlier than, the, than everything else up there. species of, of uh, plant than, than the chestnut okay, that you were talking about. Still a chestnut. Well, it's called a chestnut, but we're, we're, we're concerned with a different species altogether here. It's not, it's not from a tree, it's from a grass, it's from a sedge. The, the horse chestnut, the, the tree that's related to it in this country is the, is the buckeye, which uh, 
Ohio is known as the Buckeye State. And they have some of the arboretum, so you can see what they look like. They have the same type of leaf. But the difference is that the Buckeye, um, their outer husk doesn't have any prickers on them. They're smooth. Okay, here's the autumn, the autumn colors. They turn yellow and then kind of brown. And here's that hypervirulent bark. It looks like the tree's got leprosy, doesn't it? There's actually a living tree underneath all of that cruddy bark. <laughs> and the tree is doing okay. And a lot of times they're there in Sharon, there's a great big rock right behind the tree also. Okay, this is uh, one of our breeding orchards out in um, Renthrum. You can see how heavy laden this tree is. It's actually leaning over. Dave and I are harvesting the chestnuts before the squirrels get them. And here again, you can see just heavy, heavy, prolific tree. And there they are. Usually three, three nuts per burr. Oh. Did you roast them? They're delicious. You can eat them raw. You can the 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 the, the the shells on these are so thin, you can grind them up with your teeth and just can eat them raw. They're delicious. I do it all the time. So here's, you see Dave is wearing a heavy pair of gloves. Those burrs, they're like really sharp, really sharp. Here's a seed orchard in Western Massachusetts. So it's one of those big thousand, thousands or hundreds of trees. You can see the, um, the little netting there. That is actually deer protection. As the tree will grow, we'll move that up the pole to protect the most tender part of the tree, which is what the deer goes for. They, only, they don't like the lower leaves that are tough. They only like the most tender ones. So if you protect it with that netting going up the pole, it gives deer protection. It's kind of a neat little thing. Here I am at the... Uh, seed orchard that we have in Rhode Island. We're doing some weeding down there. <coughs> and here is our new high school. And why did I throw that in? Well, believe it or not, there are chestnuts all around. Dave and I walked around the perimeter here, and there are chestnuts right where the forest meets the, the open areas. And this one, one, the tree fell and smashed one. But it was a good sized tree, and hopefully, it will recover from it. It'll send up new shoots. Yeah, this would be an excellent uh, place to actually have a, a germplasm conservation orchard along those hillsides. Chestnuts do very well in well drained, sandy soil, and that's exactly what this is. We could have get a science teacher involved here and have a a germplasm conservation orchard, a few trees right out here on, on the high school. I think it would be a marvelous thing to do. I can just see it now, you know, the chestnut trees growing on that hillside. It would be great. great. All right, there I am in my front porch. And this is how we grow the chestnuts. Um, I gave all of these same trees away last year to people who are interested in growing them. They have this uh, long tap root, so you grow them in containers like this. And you can grow the nuts also in uh, a fruit juice or a half gallon container like this. And I grow them in, in recycled pots. There's a little tree in there. This has been outdoors all winter, but in the spring, in a couple of months, it'll start, it'll come back to life. The first year, the tree is really mostly making that big long tap root. The second year is when it really begins to take off. So you could have a tree like this and have it in your backyard. It would be well protected. You could move it around and figure out where you want it to go and everything like that. And if anybody wants to grow one of these in their backyard, just plant like you would a tomato. And you can be part of our breeding program too. And uh, they like pH. What's the pH of the soil? Does it? They like acid soil. Yeah, acid they soil. Like okay. acid like soil. blueberry. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they grow wonderfully with blueberries. Oh, okay, because I have blueberries. Yeah, that, yeah blueberries that. and uh, pine trees that yeah. creates yeah. the kind of acid yeah. soil that they love. And uh, 
I grow these in my back porch to give away to people, and you are all welcome to become members, and I will, I will help you to, to grow them. Here's our Jared Westbrook, who is our new science director, the Genesis, the Geneticist. And here's the new initiative that is coming from National. They, they call it the three bird. They're, they're looking at hypervariolence, transgenetics, and the back crossbreeding method. Um, and for the extra credit session coming up, um, for those of you who want to stay, I have a TED Talk presentation. I'll explain what this, um, what the transgenetic program is. It's the program which is going to give us fully blight-resistant trees within a bit, well, they already have them, and they're in a regulatory process of being approved. We can have a fully blight-resistant, pure, not a, not a hybrid tree, but a pure uh, blight-resistant uh, tree as soon as it gets governmental approval. They need to get approval from the Agricultural Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, and some other government regulatory agency. And once we have that, we'll be able to pollinate wild American chestnuts. And if you happen to have one growing in your yard, you can pollinate it too. And the nuts that they produce, half of them will be fully blight resistant. And then you have really something that you can plant and, uh, and know is going to succeed. And to explain how that program, part of the program works, I'm going to let the um, the chief scientist explain it, um, which is, who is William Powell. So, hang on to your seats, or this is the extra credit section. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get. It's. Uh, So he's killed more so fast, didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? Only God can make it for me. Yeah. Hi there, my name is Chris and I'm the co-founder of the FreedomEntrepreneurs.com. Today I'm actually shooting a video here in my backyard. We'll skip the ad. <laughs> <coughs> The first thing to think about, when is the last time you saw an American chestnut tree? Now you're probably thinking, well, I haven't seen an American chestnut tree. And that is actually a sad and true story. Only some of our most senior people have actually seen American chestnut trees the way they used to be. They used to be one of the most abundant trees in the eastern forests. So if you were to uh, look at this scene behind me of a, a patch of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, one out of four trees would have been American chestnut in this setting, okay? Quite a few trees. Now, the American chestnut was a keystone species, meaning that a lot of other animals and, and wildlife uh, relied on it for their survival. One of the main reasons why it was a keystone species is because of the mast or the nut crop that it produced year after year. It produced a very, very stable nut crop. The um, oak trees, which, which has since replaced the chestnut, do not produce that uh, consistent, stable mast as the chestnut did. Now, you're thinking nuts, well, maybe that supports things like squirrels. Well, it did support squirrels. Uh, in fact, when we lost the chestnut, the actual squirrel populations in the forest declined. Okay, but a lot of other animals also relied on chestnut. And all these that I'm showing here, even uh, some animals that are now extinct that you're hearing about in these talks today, such as the Carolina parakeet. And of course, since everybody else has mentioned it, I'm going to mention the uh, passenger pigeon also. It probably relied on American chestnut. So you think about it, if you're going to bring back a species such as the passenger pigeon, what are you bringing it back to? Well, our forests are not the same as they used to be. They used to be predominantly chestnut. So you might want to first bring back the chestnut before you bring back these other species. Okay, so what I want to try to do at this first part of my talk is to convince you that chestnut is a species worthy of restoration. And I've just shown you right here how important it is to the ecology. And it has many other values also. The American chestnut um, was also very valuable as a nut crop for agriculture. Not only did wildlife like to eat uh, chestnuts, but humans like to eat chestnuts also. Whether you like to eat it roasted, 
or candied, or ground it up into a flour where you can make soups or breads, or you can even brew it into beer. And by the way, this is a gluten-free beer for those of you who are like me who can't eat gluten, okay? Um, so it had a lot of uh, value in that way. Um, it also has very valuable for the wood that it produced. The wood was very straight grain. This was a fast-growing tree, um, so woodworkers liked it. But one of the key things about it was that it was a very rot-resistant wood. And so it could be used in outdoors without rotting. So um, what I always tell people is that chestnut was abundant like it was in the past. All your decks would be made out of chestnut instead of that old pressure-treated stuff that it's made out of now. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, all telephone poles would probably be made out of chestnut and you wouldn't have to treat them with all kinds of chemicals. Okay, so it has a very good economic value. But in addition to that, the American chestnut tree is really part of our history and part of our heritage. Okay? You probably can't go to a town without finding a chestnut street. Just like you would find an Elm Street or a Maple Street, um, you will always find a chestnut street. I particularly like this corner here, the intersection of Chestnut and Powell for obvious reasons. But this is actually in California. This is way out of the range of American chestnut, yet it's still um, recognized. Um, you've probably seen chestnut mix, mixed in songs, such as this uh, uh, very familiar song at Christmas time, and it starts off chestnuts roasting on the open fire. You might have learned this poem in uh, school at some point, uh, where it talks about under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. That is also an American chestnut. So it's really kind of part of our, our natural heritage here in the United States. Now the American chestnut, was one of the largest trees in the Eastern Forest before we lost it. Uh, this is a picture from the um, Forest Historical Society um, showing some lumberjacks in a stand of large chestnuts, and you can see how large they are. This next picture is not actually a photograph, it's a painting, of, and so it's taking a picture of a painting, but I kind of like this because it shows a different form of the chestnut. If you grow this in the open, it actually spreads like that last poem. And um, this one is showing a chestnut harvest and to kind of give you an idea of how big these trees get, there's a guy up there knocking chestnut down to people below. So these trees got quite large. Why don't we have chestnuts today? Well, we don't have them, again, because of what humans have done. We have introduced an exotic pathogen from Asia when people were start importing Asian chestnuts to plant in their yards or in their orchards to have a, a close-by supply of nuts. When we brought that over, um, the uh, a fungus that causes chestnut blight moved over with it. Now this fungus is called Cryptonectria parasitica, and it was very happy to come to the United States, as you can see here. And this is actual real plate of the fungus, believe it or not. So it came here, found a host that was totally susceptible to it, and it jumped onto the American chestnut, and within 50 years, spread through the whole range of the chestnut from down south in Georgia to up north into Maine. Okay, and it killed somewhere between three to uh, five billion chestnut trees. Okay, very, very damaging. Now, when this was happening, people were panicking, of course. Could you imagine driving down the highway and seeing the largest trees on the side of the road all dead? Uh, at least uh, half of them to a quarter of them were all just standing up dead. This is what people were seeing. Uh, so they threw a lot of resources at trying to stop the chestnut blight, but everything failed. And we basically lost the chestnut tree, at least the uh, mature large trees. Chestnut is still surviving today at the roots. So it's not extinct, it's just functionally extinct. Okay, so right now there's actually two programs that are having some success at making a blight-resistant American chestnut tree. There's a breeding program and there's a transgenic program. I am involved with the transgenic program. And I'm going to kind of do a quick comparison of the two. Each of them are viable programs, and each of them probably will have some levels of success. They each have their own um, pros and cons, though. So the breeding program, what they're doing is they're crossing American chestnut to Chinese species of chestnut that are naturally resistant to blight, because that's where the blight comes from. And then they back cross to American to try to regain all the American traits. Okay. When they do this, they end up with a tree that's 1 16th Chinese and, of course, 15 16th American, which sounds really good. And it, it is pretty good. But I want to do a little illustration for you. Let's think of the chestnut and chestnut genome as a book. Okay. And let's say that book 
is uh, filled with words, and the words represent the genes in the chestnut. Okay? We know about how many genes are in chestnut, and they would fill about a 180-page book. So if you're 1 16th Chinese, what that means, about 11 pages, or close to 3,000 words in that book, are from Chinese. In Chinese. Now that might not be important because we have a lot of duplicate gene, genes in the two, but it might be important if this was a, a critical plot line or something like that. And the reason why it's important with Chinese and American chestnut because Chinese chestnut has actually been bred for thousands of years as an orchard tree. American chestnut is a wild timber type tree. And there's a lot of traits that we don't want from the Chinese chestnut. So the problem here is you've got to then breed out all those traits you don't want, all right? That can be done. It just takes a lot, a lot of work, a lot of selection. Let's look at what you do with transgenics. Now, let's follow up that book analogy. I'm gonna take one passage out of that book, or one sentence. Uh, it's actually a sentence from Thoreau's Walden. I kinda like that, because he really likes chestnuts in that. And um, I'm gonna use that as an example. We can put in just a few genes at a time using a natural genetic engineer called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This is a bacteria that in the wild moves genes around in plants. So what scientists have done is basically tamed this bacteria so it moves genes in that we want to move in. So what we're doing is we're only moving two to four genes into the tree. So we're not making a big change, we're making a very small change to the tree. And now we don't have to go back and try to get rid of genes that we put in there that we don't really want. Okay, so that's an advantage with transgenics. So where do we get these genes from? Well, we can get them from the same place we get the genes for the breeding program. We can get them from Chinese chestnut species. And we actually are looking at genes from those species. Uh, some from Castanea melissima, some from uh, Castanea sanguinii. But another powerful thing about transgenics is you can move genes actually from other plants. And I'm gonna give you an example of one of those that have given us some success this summer. And that is a gene that comes from wheat. And we like this because this is a gene that you normally eat all the time anyway in the gene product, so it's generally safe. But more importantly is that the way this gene works, it detoxifies the acid that the fungus uses to attack the tree. We know that this fungus, the only way it can form a canker and kill a tree is to throw oxalic acid at it. If you can remove that, it can no longer form a canker. All right? So what we're basically doing is giving the tree an ability to defend itself against the fungus. The tree is not killing the fungus, it's only defending itself against the fungus, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you some of our exciting results from this past summer. Uh, this is a, an uh, experiment where we were measuring the size of the canker growth on uh, some American chestnut trees, Chinese chestnut trees, and some of our transgenic ones. This first line represents the growth on an American chestnut tree. The higher that line goes, the bigger the canker, and eventually will girdle the branch, killing everything above it. So that's American chestnut, very susceptible. If you look at Chinese chestnut, it has a much smaller canker. We call it this a superficial canker. It does not kill the branch. Right? Let's look at our transgenic American chestnut that has um, the oxalate oxidase gene. And what's exciting here is it's tracking along with the Chinese chestnut. So we've definitely shown that we can enhance light resistance using these methods and with this particular gene. Now we're gonna uh, do this again this, following, this coming summer because you always have to repeat things in science, but things are looking very good. So let's look at what we have right now. We have American chestnut, which is very susceptible on your uh, left. We have Chinese chestnut, which is more resistant on your right. This tree that I just showed you called the Darling Four Tree is approaching the level of resistance of the, American, of the uh, Chinese chestnut. Now what's really exciting is we have some new trees that's coming out of our lab right now for the summer. And these trees make more of this enzyme that detoxifies the acid, okay? And what we're finding in our preliminary tests, we think these might even be more resistant than the Chinese chestnut. And so this is very exciting for us. Again, we have to test them in the field, which we'll be doing over the next few years. Okay, so what do you do once you have a resistant chestnut tree, okay? One thing, when we make these, we want to make a few of them. So they're not gonna be very uh, diverse. So we have to try to increase the genetic diversity of these before we put them in a restoration program. And we do that by going to the surviving uh, trees in the field and crossing them with our transgenic tree. And we just developed a new method that allows us to produce pollen 
from either seedlings or from plantlets in less than a year. Typically in the field, it takes three to seven years to get pollen. Okay. So we have a, a method now that we can get pollen in one year, the next year we get another group of pollen, and we can outcross it until we get a very diverse group of, of trees. We've actually done this. We've actually produced nuts from these crosses. These nuts have inherited the gene that we put in, which is an important point. And we also now have nuts that we are sending away to some of our colleagues at Oak Ridge National Lab to check to make sure the nuts aren't any different than the wild type nuts. And that's important also. Okay, so what do we do next from there? Well, to start a restoration program, one of the cons of uh, using transgenics is that these things are highly regulated. They're regulated by three agencies, the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA. So before we can just release a tree to anybody, we have to get their approval. But once we get their approval, then we can treat it like any other tree and start a restoration program. So how do we get into a restoration program? Well, the range of the American chestnut is large. There used to be a lot of trees there. You don't just go out like Johnny Appleseed and spread them around. So what I like to think of is uh, restoration has to start at what I like to call restoration foci. These are small areas where you can start to establish a group of trees and then slowly they'll move out from there. This can be on a historic sites if you want to try to restore a historic site to what it looked like 100 years ago. It could be on private landowners. But what, what I really like is restoration of mine lands. There's a lot of places in the Appalachia where they mine coal, the uh, mines are done, and they want to return those to the forest. These are primary, uh, very good places to start restoration using chestnut because there's no trees there to start with. And we don't want to cut down trees that are already there. Now, where do you go from that point? Well, the next point is really coming, gets out of our hands and goes into your hands, okay? This is where the people do the restoration. This is a century-long project. So we need you, we need you, and we need you to help with this, okay? We need you and your children and your grandchildren to bring these trees back, because it's gonna take a long time to get back to the over a billion trees in the forest. So if you're interested in helping them with restoration, you can contact the American Chestnut Foundation. I've got the website here, and they are always looking for help. So I'm going to stop there and give thanks to the many colleagues who helped us uh, get to this point in the research. Uh, I didn't do this all myself. This is on the backs of many, many researchers. I'd like to thank you for coming here and just recognize all the supporters over the years. Thank you. So you can be part of it, too. Not that hard to do. Not all that hard to do. So, I guess uh, that just about does it for our president. It's been a long presentation. It's going on 9 o'clock. Thank you for your patience in coming here. I know we were snowed out the first uh, go around. This is, here's the website. We have a new website, and you can find the chapter. There. Um, what I'd suggest people do if you're interested is become a member of the Massachusetts chapter, and then go over here and keep an eye on New York, because New York is where they're developing this transgenetic tree. If you want, um, we think that the pollen is going to be available for blight resistance in two to three years. Uh, so if you want to get a tree started in your yard, great. What might even be better, if you go out in your own backyard, if you find a tree that is already there, if you can clear out the area around it so that it gets daylight, you get a thing to flower, you will have one of these surviving American chestnuts that they're looking to outcross. So when they, the, the, the tree that's coming out of the lab is essentially an inbred clone, and it lacks the genetic diversity of the trees that are out in the wild. So they have to cross this thing to the trees that are out in the wild. And we have the trees out in the wild right here in Massachusetts. And Dave and I are out collecting the nuts, and we're planting them, and we're giving them away for free for people who want to grow them. So become a member and start growing a tree. It takes about five years before the trees produce pollen, and then seven years before they produce burrs. So the sooner, the more trees that we can get, to flower out in the wild, the better shape we're going to be for this for this breeding program that's going on in New York. 
So please take a brochure, consider joining the Massachusetts chapter, and keep an eye on what's going on in New York. And that's very exciting. It's an accelerated program. And you can be part of it, too. It really depends on volunteers and citizens, just like you and me. When he said you and you and you, he meant you and you and you. <laughs> okay, that's it.